Good morning. It's good to be together again, and uh, we will now be doing the fourth of the series on, uh, on Romans. And our subject this morning will be the doctrine of original sin. Before we begin, let us bow and have a word of prayer. Father, you know our needs. You know the truths of your word that you want us to cherish and understand. And I pray this morning that you'll prepare us for an understanding of this issue. In the name of Jesus, amen. The doctrine of original sin has been a perplexity and a problem to the church for nearly, uh, for over 1,600 years. Uh, and it was introduced by Augustine, the idea that God imputed the sins of Adam unto all of his children. And this is taken so seriously that the Roman church uh, requires, if you're working in a, in a Catholic hospital, they require, even if you're not Catholic, that you baptize a little baby if, he's, if the fetus is born or if the baby is born and dies or if the baby uh, is uh, in danger of death, that there should be a baptism to remove that uh, sin of Adam. This is not according to the Bible, and it is not uh, uh, according to the principles of God's character. And this morning, we're going to be discussing this. And uh, as we've discussed Romans, we've done so in the context of Plymouth Brethren Doctrine, which Desmond Ford uh, holds. And that Plymouth Brethren Doctrine uh, is based on the doctrine of original sin. And so this morning we're going to uh, examine that and we'll begin by a statement that universal sin is caused by universal sinning. Universal sin is not caused by God's imputing uh, sin unto us, but according to Scripture, Romans 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed on all men, for that all have sinned. Now, according to Paul, the reason why all men die is that all men have sinned. Now, this does not mean uh, that... Uh, that uh, Adam's sin is not impacting us because it is. The race was cut off from God, but God does not impute sin to man. The theory of the original sin is that God imputes sin to man, and then God imputes the grace of Christ to all men. And uh, we will notice that as we go along. As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon men, for that all have sinned. Now you'll notice that little F ho, that is uh, what is translated for that, and it may be uh, it translated in various ways, because or inasmuch as, but uh, King James has f f for that. The fact is that the universal sinning is not a legal thing that God has imputed to men that has caused men to sin. It is rather, um, it is the result of the inheritance, biological inheritance of Adam. Now, let us notice what the uh, translators say about F. Ho. There are a number of versions that I've mentioned here and uh, all of the, uh, the more serious translations have uh, a cause and effect shown here. In other words, we die because uh, all have died, all die because all have sinned. 
at NKGV and NASB, NIV, and NRSV, all render it because all sinned. Coney Barenhausen, a New English Bible, Goodspeed, Montgomery, have various causative uh, expressions. J.P. Green, Sr., whose interlinear I have, translates it, death passed to all men inasmuch as all sinned. But in each of these, it's a causative fact. One is the cause, the other is the effect. Uh, the cause of death to all men is that all have sinned. Now, we're going to read another verse in uh, King James. And by the way, that verse, as well, we've translated above, is from the King James Version. As by one man centered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, that all sinned, is from the King James. Now we're going to read the, their translation of verse 18, which does not harmonize with their own translation of verse 12. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men and to justification of life. Now, obviously, the translators were under the influence of uh, Augustine when they translated this. If you'll notice the green uh, part, uh, judgment came upon and the free gift came upon, uh, those have been inserted. Those are part of... They were not a part of the, of the uh, Greek that was being translated, but rather inserted in order to make sense by the, by the uh, translators. However, the result of this is to confuse the issue. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification uh, expresses the view of the translators. Uh, about 30% of all the words in this verse have been added by the King James uh, translators. I know of no passage in Scripture that, that the translators have taken such freedom to, to add words to in order to, to uh, make it fit. The fact is that none of these does Paul have. In fact, Paul does not have any verbs. He uses the preposition ace, a double ace, to have a verbal effect, but he does not give any er verbs, and we'll discuss that now. <clears throat> it's important for us to read verse 18 uh, in, in a way to recognize that. Otherwise, uh, we may not know what, uh, what to think of it. Uh, Therefore, as by the offense of one, and then the next word is ace. It doesn't say judgment came upon. It just says, Wherefore, therefore, as by offense of one, ace all men, ace, to condemn, ace, condemnation too is, a, is ace. That's a translation of ace. And then it says, even so, by the righteousness of one, ace all men, ace justification of life. Now, Paul is using expressions that were uh, acceptable in those days. We don't have that kind of uh, expression. But Paul was using the word ace to mean to or toward. Now, let's read it with that in mind. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that offense is ace toward all men to condemnation. Now, since all men have accepted that one sin and have sinned, all die. But notice the ace is, takes the place of a verb. There's no verb there. Therefore, as by the offense of one, ace, 
It moves toward all men to condemnation. Ace all, toward all men, and ace would be to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the uh, ace all men, ace justification of life. Now, all men have not received that gift, but it has come to all men. When Christ died, he died for all men. But all men were not justified when he died, but justification was provided for all men, and that justification that was provided for all men moves toward each person individually, and the individual makes a decision as to whether or not to receive that justification or not, whether to uh, confess his sins and to receive the righteousness of Christ. Now we'll read this as it is without the extra words. Therefore, as by the offense of one, ace all men. Ace condemnation. In other words, the offense moved toward all men, and the purpose of that offense was to infect them and cause them to die. The result is condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, one, ace, that righteousness moves toward all men for the purpose of justifying them. Ace, to justify them. Now, the fact is that everyone has received sin, therefore is under the death penalty, but not everyone receives the justification of life. I'm going to read this now from the King James and then from, I should say, from the Green, Green's translation, and then from King James. So then, as through one offense, and, and Green has in parenthesis, it was toward all men to condemnation. And that too is ace, ace condemnation. So also, by one accomplished righteousness, toward all men to justification of life. And that last two justification is ace justification. Therefore, as King James says, therefore as the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Well, the fact is that uh, judgment does come upon all men because all have sinned. Then it says, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men and the justification of life. Nothing is said in that passage about a free gift coming upon all men. But what it does say is that the righteousness of Christ is moved toward everyone who uh, must receive it by faith. And that nothing is said in this passage about faith. But all the way through Romans, it keeps talking about justification by faith. So universal justification is a product of the doctrine of original sin. And uh, while, while Des Ford and Plymouth Brethren teach from this passage the doctrine of original sin, the actual fact is Paul is talking about governments in conflict. And we will now notice that. The transfer in these passages is a transfer from the reign of sin to the reign of righteousness for all Jews and Gentiles who receive the gift of righteousness. And this is very clear in verse 17 and also throughout. But death reigned from Adam until Moses, even on those who had not sinned in the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a type of the coming one. For if the offense of one, pardon me, if by the offense of one, death reigned by one, notice the, the kingdoms in conflict here, if by the offense of the one, death reigned by the one, much more those who are receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall rule in life. Please notice, 
This is not talking about what happened in 2000 uh, in, in 31 AD. It's not talking about uh, a, a universal uh, uh, justification. It's talking about an individual justification that takes place now. Much more those who are, and we could put the word now in there, but we're now receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall rule. Those who are receiving this will rule. But notice there are two rules. Death reigned, that's a ruling. That's a death reigned, and then grace is to reign. And notice the gift of righteousness shall rule. Whereas sin reigned, with death as a result, now the gift of righteousness permits us to look forward to the rule in the future, shall rule in life by one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through the one offense, it was accomplished, uh, pardon me, it was toward all men to condemnation, and this is from, from Green, so also by one accomplished righteousness toward all men to justification of life. God wants to justify everyone. The Bible says that God uh, would like to, uh, to save everyone, but he cannot because it's based on the choice of the individuals. We were not around to choose in 31 AD, but we are here today and must make a choice if we're going to rule in life. Accomplish righteousness toward all men to justification of life. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were constituted sinners, so also by the obedience of the one shall many be constituted righteous. That as sin ruled in death, so grace might rule through righteousness to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And these are verses uh, 17 to 19 and verses to, verse 21. Uh, the only verse, uh, well, well, the only thing we've done is to read it from Green, uh, which translates it literally instead of adding a lot of words. So we find that the issue that Paul is talking about has to do with the reigning of sin that is to be changed by the reigning of death. And this, Paul indicates over and again, will be done by faith, by the choice to believe. Every chapter in Romans contributes to the causative F ho in in Romans 5.12, in other words, because, cause and effect, we die because we've sinned. A universal reign of sin and death results from natural man's universal bondage to sin. And that is through his own enslaved will. So something must happen to change us from the government of sin to the government of righteousness. And that something has to do with the connection of our will and Christ's grace. We choose his grace. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings the will of man and the grace of Christ into connection so that man is actually justified or brought back into the very uh, communion that sin separated him from, the communion with God. Thus, cause and effect, based on choice, human choice to believe, rather than on universally imputed sin and legally declared justification, dominates the very passage that is given, uh, which is taken to, to uh, uh, give evidence of of original sin. This is a key passage. Adam chose to surrender his kingdom to a master who enslaved all his children by controlling the will. So each church chose to sin. Christ chose to redeem the entire race 
restoring to his kingdom all who choose to believe in him as a substitute and surety. Grace then moves to or toward each man or woman, child, and what is the purpose? For justification. But the justification only takes place if we choose it. The cross did care for our sin debt, and the gift of faith inspires. By the way, it's, it's only the Holy Spirit that, that sets our wills free to choose. So the gift of faith inspires us to receive that gift, to claim freedom from the bondage of Satan and sin, the kingdom of sin. sin thus entitling us to share in Christ's uh, throne of righteousness. Universal reconciliation precedes personal justification by faith. There's no suggestion of original sin or original justification anywhere in Romans or any place else in the scripture uh, uh, that would identify justification as taking place universally at the cross. But Christ did legally reconcile the human race to God, bearing its guilt and paying its penalty. And that is why Jesus is shown in John. He refers back to Jacob's dream when he was fleeing his brother and, and uh, because he deceived his father, he was fleeing. And that night, he saw the angels of God on a ladder that reached to heaven, going up and down. And in that dream, he understood that heaven is somehow connected to earth and that we do have communion between heaven and earth. And when Jesus was here, he referred to that. And he says, speaks about the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Christ is that ladder. He's the one that connects sinful man with a sinless God and in such a way that man can be brought back into communion with God. So, he provides probation to all. Justification is a part I should say, the reconciliation, I should say, of the whole, whole uh, uh, race gives probation to all men to make a choice. And we have to have two things in order to make a choice. Christ has to die for our sins, otherwise we would have no hope. And the Holy Spirit has to free our wills to choose that death, otherwise we still have no hope. But when Christ died, he provided a way to escape for every man. And as the grace comes to every man, so in the very action of that grace comes the provision for freeing man's will to make a choice. Meanwhile, he urges, this is God, urges or Christ, urges all to freely receive his justification of life by the simple faith that assures final justification through judgment to rule in Christ's eternal kingdom. Yesterday we found out that justification and judgment are connected. Justification assures me of God's present communion and, and, and the ability to, to live in him and be empowered by him. But there is a judgment to determine whether I have retained that connection. I do not retain the connection simply because I was connected. I do by daily exercising my decision, my choice, when I have choices between good and evil. And this is what develops character. And without the exercise of the will, there's no development of character. Only God could reconcile. For all not only have weakened corrupt natures, but willfulness and guilt result in self-defense. What was the first thing Adam did when God came walking in the garden after he sinned? Yes, well, the first thing he did before that was to make fig leaves garments to try to cover himself, but that wasn't enough. 
when God came walking in the garden, he ran and hid. The sinner hides from God because of guilt. And therefore, God has to take the initiative, which Christ has done in taking care of our guilt. We instinctively hide from him, as did Adam and Eve, by sacrificing himself for his ungodly enemies. And these are quotes from Romans 5, 6, and 10. Christ reconciled the world, satisfying justice and removing all need for divine enmity. He demonstrated, because you see, God's enmity is against sin. But when Christ died, that enmity no longer needs to be directed at man because that Christ has taken man's place. He demonstrated his longing to reconcile and justify all. Thus, his amnesty permits the most degraded sinner to come boldly and without fear to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. And this is why Paul speaks of God justifying the ungodly. How could anything else happen? If they're ungodly, they can't justify themselves. But when God justifies the ungodly, they do not remain ungodly. And this is the important thing about justification. It brings us into the very presence of God, who through the Holy Spirit gives us a new life uh, and new habits and, and so forth, according to our own will to receive that. Universal corporate reconciliation of the world permitted probationary time for personal reconciliation or justification by faith. Now notice the reconciliation of the world that took place when Christ died did, did include all of us because it took care of all of our sins. But it did not justify us. That justification is by faith in what Christ has done. But it did permit a probationary period for us to make our decision and to become personally re reconciled or justified by faith. God was in Christ, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, reconciling the world. Now, it didn't say the individuals, but the world. The world has been, uh, has, has been, the sin of the world has been covered. Reconciling the world into himself not imputing their sins unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And then he follows by saying, Be ye therefore reconciled unto God. Now, Christ has reconciled the world. He defeated the enemy, Satan, and has made it possible for us all to unite in his kingdom. And here's where we get the kingdom's in conflict. This earth is dominated by the enemy. Satan is the god of this earth and he rules through sin. Christ died so that we could choose to become part of his government. He defeated Satan and established the fact that he has a right to this world. And now he gives us the uh, word of the general reconciliation and invites us to be reconciled individually or justified. Scripture never identifies corporate rec reconciliation as justification. Only personal rec reconciliation is justification by faith. All who are now who now receive personal reconciliation shall be saved by his life. As in the process of healing, we learn ever more fully to deny self-centered impulses. Now, the all in verse 18 is, uh, comes at the very apex of chapters 1 to 16. Paul uses all in two different ways. Well, first of all, he speaks of all mankind in chapters 1 and 2 and, and throughout 3, nearly all of 3. He 
uses the word all to refer to all sinners, which would be all mankind. But later in that same chapter, he uses all to, connected with believe, all who believe. So in one case, it's all who have sinned, which is everyone, universal, and the other is another universal, but it's a sub-universal, all who believe. If you believe, this is what happens. If you don't, you become part of the all who sin, but not all who receive justification. The all sinned in chapter 512 is a universal all, for all sinned. And this is implied in chapters 1, 2, and actually most of 3, where it identifies all Gentiles as well as all Jews as having sinned. This is explicit in chapter 3, verse 12. But the all who receive justification of life, which is recorded in chapter 5, 18, is introduced in chapter 3, 22, and it is the limited to the all who believe, which means the Jews and Gentiles with no distinction. This limited all of justification by faith continues throughout Romans, but climaxes in chapters, chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, which is the apex or the high point, uh, which Apex also introduces a governments in conflict theme, which we've spoken about, that climaxes in chapter 8. Both themes, all who believe and governments in conflict, continue, however, to the very end of, of Romans, and they're very important to understand. So let me just say again that chapter 5 uh, introduces a governments in conflict. So what we're talking about has to do with the fact that justification is a transfer from the government of sin to the government of righteousness, the government of death to the government of eternal life. Verses 15 to 21, every verse but one repeats the twofold all, uh, the universal death as a result of man's sin met by universal justification to all who believe and claim the righteousness of one man. Throughout Romans, a distinction is made between all who sin and all who believe. The all who believe is never the same as the all who sin because only a few, relatively few, have been willing to accept Christ's sacrifice. Moreover, the conflict of governments, that is, the government of, of sin and the government of righteousness, the, more of the conflict of governments introduced there in chapter 5 continues in chapter 6 in regard to baptism. Paul announces that we die to the rule of sin and death and are resurrected to the Spirit's rule of life. And that issue continues through 7 and 8. In chapter 7, it shows that we must continue to die to the flesh because the flesh, if it rules, that it puts us under the government of sin and, and of Satan. Otherwise, if we continue uh, to trust, chapter 8 shows us that the Holy Spirit sets us free from the rule of sin and death, and gives us a new life. As believers with both an old and a new nature, we must continually choose between the two masters. We either choose life that Christ offers, or we automatically continue a, a revert back to a rule uh, uh, reign of sin. To be free from the tyranny of the flesh, which is uh, referred to chapter 616, we must consistently reject the reign of sin in our mortal body, according to verse 12. Now, 
I plan one more lecture of this series, which will be the fifth lecture, and that lecture will have to do with the nature of Christ, and I plan to present that because in the process of dealing with the governments in conflict, Paul, and right in the center of that, introduces the nature of Christ, or the, the, uh, the um, what should I say, the, uh, uh, the birth of Christ. The um, word has slipped my mind right now. Uh, incarnation of Christ. Well, let us bow our heads. Father, thank you for your many blessings. We pray for your presence this morning in the rest of our day that we may live in the, uh, the uh, rule uh, of, of righteousness and the kingdom of righteousness under the rule of the Holy Spirit. And that we may put to death the deeds of the flesh, that we may by grace through the power of, that you offer to empower our will to deny self and to follow you. In the name of Jesus, amen.